When I was in seminary, I remember I was going for a little trip with uh, one of the priests in our community uh, from France, and uh, he had a very interesting habit when we were driving. So where we were living, it's, it's a place called Aricha, Ar Aricha. It's outside the city of Rome, and it's very hilly. Uh, so this French priest, whenever we'd be driving on the hills, stopped in traffic. There was an awful lot of traffic everywhere because it's near Rome. Um, he just ride the clutch the whole time. You know, he just he'd be on the hill, and it would smell like an angle grinder inside the car. Like he just smelled the burning clutch, burning clutch, and he would go, oh, traffic. <laughs> And, and I'd be like, oh, burning clutch. <laughs> um, uh, and so, uh, and I, just, I felt bad, because like, obviously I was young, and he's like a lot older than me. But I, I, at a certain point, I just said, um, if you pull the handbrake, you're going to save the clutch. It'll really make things an awful lot easier. You know, if you just pull the handbrake and just, just, just have mercy on the clutch, OK? <laughs> just, she is roasting. Just pull the handbrake, and actually you'll find it's an awful lot easier, because the car will just hold itself okay anyway and he said really and I said yeah just 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 pull just put it you know pull the handbrake and then just put it in neutral the car will just will just wait there and, uh, and he said right I've been I've been doing it wrong for 25 years and I said, well, evidently <laughs> and uh, and it's interesting when we discover at a certain point that we've been doing something wrong for years right doing something wrong for years and in our spiritual lives, this should actually be a good thing, right? If we discover in our spiritual lives that there's something that we need to improve or should improve, and maybe we've been doing it wrong for years, well, thank God. Thank God that we've discovered we've been doing it wrong for years. Um, I remember as well, I was in, in a parish once, and there was a person who used to uh, spend their holy hour, they do adoration, and they'd spend their holy hour with the Irish Catholic, right, which is, for those who aren't Irish, is obviously an Irish Catholic newspaper, just uh, like the universe, the Catholic universe, if that's still for sale in the UK. Um, it's a Catholic paper, and they kind of read it from cover to cover. So be, during the holy hour, Jesus exposed there, I'm here in my row. Oh, yeah. New Bishop of Elphin. Right. And just kind of reading through the Irish Catholic. And it may or may not have inspired a homily, which I may have mentioned something like that, and how to maybe uh, use our time better in adoration. And, and, and it helped them. Now, I don't know if they had one of these experiences where they went, wow, I've been doing it wrong all of my life. But it, these things are actually good. They're a small bit humbling at the time, <laughs> maybe more than a small bit. They can be very humbling at the time when you realize, I've been doing it wrong, right? But it's so important especially in our spiritual lives, that we recognize that there is more to come, that there is more I can do, which doesn't mean necessarily like more time in the chapel or pray more rosaries, but we can go deeper, right? That it's, it's, all, it's about the interior life. And I'm, I'm, I'm really preaching to myself here as well because I, I know I can and should and I'm called to go deeper as well, you know, to a deeper relationship with the Lord on a daily basis. You know, a deeper fervor, a deeper, a deeper prayer life, a deeper love, a deeper selflessness. You know, and this was the experience that uh, St. Uh, Teresa of Avila had. W and it was one of the first things that really struck me about her life because do you know when you hear stories about saints and you go, this person was born into a poor family and they prayed the rosary and then they entered the convent and they became a saint and they wrote loads of holy books and so we're praying for them today. Grant, so that's nice. Okay. But what I loved about St. Teresa of Avila uh, was that I'll get to the part I loved. I'll just give the back, back story first. So she was born in 1515 in Avila in Spain. Uh, her father obviously got married and uh, first wife died, uh, got married again. Um, the second wife was St. Teresa's mother. Uh, and then that, that wife died as well at a relatively young age. At, so then at the age of 13, uh, Teresa at the time uh, had lost her mom in a big family, 11 kids. And she decided then to ask Our Lady to be her mother. So you can see that like, there's something very special about this kid. You know, she's 13 years of age and she's already asking Our Lady to be her mother uh, after her, her, her biological mother's death. And so, she, you know, she, she grows up well, but she always noticed the profound effect that bad company had on her. You know, uh, like what she said... Um, you know, she'd read through the, the Gospels and maybe find it hard to remember a Gospel passage, but she would never forget the 
inappropriate jokes that her cousins told her, you know, this kind of thing where she's like, our, our natural tendency is almost towards sin. You know, we, it's, it's, it's easier. Just, just give in. It's easier. Okay. So, but like, she's not, she's not gone off the rails entirely here at all, but she's not on the road to sanctity yet. Okay. So uh, she's sent to boarding school at the, a convent school, should I say, a convent boarding school at the age of, of, of 16. And uh, she's very impressed by one of the sisters there and decides to enter. So she becomes a Carmelite sister. Again, you look at this and you go, wow, she's, she's practically a saint already. Uh, but because of the society of the time, a lot of the, the, the influence of the society of the time had also crept into the, the convent, so there was a, a, a two-tiered system. If you're from a rich family, you got the rich cells in the, in the convent, and maybe you even got two for your servants, right? And your pets, and your private fridge or equivalent of, what was it? I don't know, whatever. What was, it? what was a fridge in the 16th century? A cold room, I don't know. Um, but like basically you had a, you had your, you had, you had a suite if you, were, if, you were, uh, if you were wealthy. Whereas if you're from a poor background, oh, you got the, the north-facing, danky, rotten cells. Right? And then during Holy Communion like, or during Mass, you had the rich families, the rich sisters would sit up in the front near the radiator or equivalent thereof. Um, and they would receive a slightly bigger host and those from the poor background were sitting down the back and they'd kind of humbly come up and they'd receive, if, if they, you know, this kind of thing crept into the convent. Okay. Now, again, uh, they got on with it. They were all sisters. I mean, they're praying every day. They're not killing anyone. So surely everything is perfect. And at the age of 40, and this is the bit I love, at the age of 40, she has this experience where she sees, a, I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, a statue of, of our Lord before the crucifixion. And it just strikes her like a lightning bolt to the heart where she says, what am I doing? I've been in a convent now for 20 years. And it's actually comfortable. I've been choosing the, com the easy route, the path of least resistance. It's, I mean, it's grand, yeah, say me prayers, do me thing like, but have I given myself to the Lord entirely? No, I haven't. I haven't. This is a fairly handy, comfortable life. I've been doing it wrong. She's a sister for 20 years at this point, and she realizes she's been doing it wrong. And so this experience leads her to a, 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 radical, a radical rediscovery of her vocation. And with all of the dramatic consequences of that. She goes to her superior and says, uh, dear Mother Superior, I think we're living a life that's a little too comfortable now. I don't know what the Mother Superior's lifestyle was, but she obviously had seen all this and wasn't changing it. So she says, yeah, you'll be all right, love. Just put on your comfortable slippers now, you'll be fine. Uh, she said, no, no, we're, this, isn't, this isn't what we're called to. And she felt this desire to reform the Carmelites. Now, like, Reforming anything is hard. Why? Because those who are in it at the time don't want to be reformed. That's why they're there. They've made the system the way it is, and they like it the way it is. You know, it's like someone coming into government and saying, I think we need to pay more taxes. <laughs> you know, like, it's not going to go down well. Uh, so, like, I think we need to fast more. I think we need to live a life of greater poverty. I think we need to have a life of deeper, more fervent prayer. Like, how is that going to go down? Well, not well. It didn't go down well. Uh, so she was despised by many of her own community. Loved by others. Because some other, others saw this, this, this more radical way of life. This, this is what I feel called to. This is what the Lord has, has placed in my heart. This is how I should serve. And so eventually she was able to get permission to set up the Discalced Carmelites. Discalced for, it means barefoot, so... They, were, they went around barefoot or, or, or sandals. Um, so that, that, the, the point is then like to, to, to reform the Carmelites in a, a more fervent, authentic, selfless, self-sacrificial manner. And, and it worked, but it was, it was hard going. It was hard going. And I'll say this, so she had her kind of conversion at the age of 40. Now, I said, that's, that's, that's a great consolation for me. 
Um, <laughs> because because I'm 41, and 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 because you know, as I say, that, that a person can recognise at that age, I'm I'm called to more, I'm called to more. So I think we we can be greatly consoled by that. There's just uh, one or two little points I wanted to emphasise about her life, uh, as regards why why this awakening kind of took so long. And she says herself, she says, I was careless about sin. Right? Now, we should be careful here because, remember, keep in mind the way people today see the Christian life or, or, or the Catholic life, what we're called to. As we've said a million times here, uh, people's standard for Catholicism is that, at best, right, you go to Mass on the weekends and you don't kill anyone. That's kind of it. You know, the, if you ask most people what's the first commandment, they'll say, uh, don't kill. It's not the first commandment. It is a commandment. It is not the first commandment. It's not even within the, 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 the first three. Uh, or four, uh, but but it's 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 it, that's a really low bar, okay. But she says, she says she says she was careless about sin. She says as for venial sins, I paid little attention, and that is what destroyed me. Venial sins. As for venial sins, I paid very little attention. Yeah, sure, it's just a little sin, and that's what destroyed me. Very interesting. She also says then, as regards her experience with some priests at the time. Remember, this is the 16th century. She says, when I was talking to priests, what was venial sin, they said, was no sin at all. And what was serious mortal sin, they said, was venial. This did me so much harm. And I went on in this blindness for, I believe, more than 17 years until a Dominican father, a very learned man, enlightened me about very many things. Be careful and attentive until you see that you are strongly determined not to offend the Lord, that you would lose a thousand lives rather than commit venial sin. This was what she says about herself. She was careless about sin, even the small ones, you know? And I, just, I love that, 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 that phrase in there, which I think we can take as our, our resolution today, that we should be we should do everything in our power to not offend the Lord, even by venial sins. It's like if, if, that, if that's our bar, then obviously mortal sin won't even, you know, won't even cross our minds. Whereas if we're just aiming not to commit mortal sin, oh, sure, it happens on occasion. You know, aim high, aim high, aim not even to offend the Lord. And, and I like I like phrasing it that way. I think it's important to phrase it that way to not offend the Lord. It's not about just I don't know, not going to hell, but not even offend the Lord by committing a venial sin. And so then we can have this, well, I, I would actually wish and pray for all of us that we have repeated a spiritual awakenings, that every couple of years, and that, that's often what happens in, in maybe in a place like Medjugorje, you know, things are going grand. You go to Medjugorje and you realize, wow, I should be praying more, or the adoration here is, is, is amazing and so helpful. Maybe I should do more adoration at home. And so it's kind of a yearly spiritual awakening at times, you know, when people go back on a regular basis. But I, I, would, I would hope, I would pray that all of us can have an experience like that, which is a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit shaking, you know, it's a bit, it, it's a bit unnerving when you realize, eh, maybe I've been doing it wrong, or maybe I've dropped my bar, maybe I've, I've, I've been making compromises, maybe I've settled with my spiritual life, which is the equivalent of spiritual death. Uh, sure, it's grand, like a sure, bit of prayer here and there, don't kill anyone. That's, that's not the fervor, that's not the fire and zeal, that's not the love that we should have for the Lord. It's not what he deserves. So we can pray today for, for ourselves and, and to give the Lord permission to, to wake us up, to give us a bit of a shake and to say, you're called to more, you're called to sanctity. Your call to greatness. Saint Teresa writes that this grace of a deeper conversion was something that she prayed for. It was something that she asked for. It was something that she, as such, gave permission to the Lord to grant her. I think we can do that. I think we should do that today. Lord, I want to go deeper. Lord, I want to pray better. Lord, I want to be a saint. 
So Lord, I give you permission in my life to prune what needs to be pruned, as we read in our gospel, to root out what should not be there, to cleanse my heart that I may bear more fruit, that I may become the saint that you're calling me to be. Amen.